In today's show, we will meet Dr. Ying Ying Chang, who wrote the book, The Woman Who Could Not Forget. She will tell us about her beautiful and courageous daughter, Iris Chang. Iris was an author, a historian, and a human rights activist. Internationally acclaimed, by the age of 29, she died by her own hands at the age of 36. So please stay tuned. Welcome to The Better Part, a program that encompasses a diverse spectrum of topics important to our community, which we hope will both inform and entertain you. We invite you to sit back and enjoy the program. Hello, I'm Susan Mann of The Better Part. I'm very pleased to welcome Dr. Ying Ying Chang. Uh, Dr. Chang has a PhD from Harvard University in biochemistry and has worked as a research scientist at the University of Illinois until her retirement in, two, the, in the year 2000. May I call you Ying Ying? Yes, of course. <laughs> Ying Ying, we have a short clip that introduces Iris. Shall we watch it now? Sure. Iris was commissioned to write the biography of Tian Xue Shen, the brilliant Chinese scientist who was deported from the United States during the McCarthy era and who later became the father of the Chinese Missile Program. Iris honed her research and writing skills with her first book, Thread of the Silkworm. Her second book, The Rape of Nanjing, landed on the New York Times bestseller list and Iris achieved recognition and renown as an author, a lecturer, and activist throughout the world. This is the first book that was widely read that told about the atrocities committed by the Japanese during World War II. Her third book, The Chinese in America, was published in 2003 and was very favorably received. She is very impressive indeed. First, let us talk about how you raised such an amazing daughter. Now, Ying Ying, you and your husband were both born in mainland China. Could you tell us how you ended up in the United States? Well, yeah. Um, my husband and I met in Taiwan. Uh, his parents and my parents uh, live in the same town, uh, suburban of Taipei. Mm -hmm. uh, they knew each other. And uh, my husband and I was in the same uh, high school, mm -hmm. uh, so, but uh, he is three years ahead of me. Mm -hmm. And we, uh, he was a good friend of my brother and also in the same class of my brother. So I know him for a long time, but we didn't date until I was in college and he ha was in graduate school already. Mm -hmm. We are very fortunate to get a uh, ha uh, Harvard Fellowship and they came to the United States together and uh, we got married on the uh, same uh, on the campus of Harvard University. Oh, that's very yeah. nice. Now, I understand that Iris was born in Princeton, uh, New Jersey, and then she grew up in Urbana-Champaign, where uh, you and your husband both worked at the University of Illinois. It's quite unusual with that kind of background that she speaks Chinese so well. Uh, now, how in the world did you instill such interest in China and, and, and learning Chinese? Well, um, after um, we have Iris, uh, my husband and I already decided we should teach uh, our children Chinese language, expose them to the Chinese culture. You mm -hmm. know, uh, my father has a great influence on me. Mm -hmm. uh, what um, my parents um, told us, we pass on to our children. And my father is a favorite admirer of Chinese culture. He always reminded us, no matter where we went, we should not forget our Chinese roots. So, when Iris was um, five years old, we mm -hmm. established a Chinese class in Champing Urbana. And she started uh, to uh, learn how to write and read Chinese. We also talk at home in Chinese and on the outside in English. So um, Iris is a very curious uh, girl. Um, during the, uh, she grew up uh, during the dinner time table. She will always ask 
ask many questions about our background and about the story of uh, her parents and I mean her grandparents. So um, in that kind of uh, cultures, mm -hmm. and uh, she grew up, she is a so we call it a bilingual, bicultural uh, environment. So that's why she can uh, speak uh, Chinese and know a lot about China. Well, that's wonderful. I know a lot of parents who tried to do that and didn't really succeed. Now, the story of how your parents were almost separated from each other during the 1937 Japanese invasion of Nanjing was very dramatic. And that may have sparked Iris's interest in her background and in the rape of Nanjing. Yes. Shall we hear something about that? On July 7, 1937, Japan attacked the Marco Polo Bridge near Beijing and started a full-scale war with China. On August 13, Japanese war planes bombed Shanghai and Hangzhou. My parents still live in Nanking, the capital at the time. All branches of the government of Nanking were planning to retreat inland. My father, who worked for the government, was informed that he and his family could take a ship provided by the government to travel upstream on the Yangtze River with the working unit to the Hunan province. On November 14, a month before Nanking fell to the Japanese army, my mother took my sister Ningning back to her home village near Yixing to retrieve her mother and her younger brother so they could escape together with her family since my mother's father had just died. Ningning was one year old and my mother was seven months pregnant with my brother Zhen Zhen. After my father learned that his working unit was going to retreat to Wuhu, he immediately sent a person with a message to inform my mother that when she came back, she should take the intricate waterways to Wuhu, a city southwest of Nanking, upstream on the Yangtze River, instead of coming back to Nanking because public transportation, buses or trains are often interrupted by the Japanese bombings. On the day my father was boarding the ship at Wuhu, my mother and her family still had not arrived. They had been supposed to get to Wuhu four days before. My father waited and waited on the waterfront every day. He walked up and down the piers and checked every little boat loaded with refugees approaching the dock. But my mother was not inside. When the government ship was about to depart on the last day, my father almost went crazy. In desperation, he started screaming my mother's name, eBay, eBay, at every arriving boat. Then a miracle happened. Along came a little boat, and my mother's head popped out and answered, Yes, I'm here. My father repeated this story many times in family gatherings when we were growing up and told us that he thanked God for the miracle. Otherwise, my mother and all the family members with her would not have survived the Sino-Japanese War. father said that the rape of Nanking had been so intense that um, thousands upon thousands of people were killed and the bodies that had been thrown into the Yangtze River during the carnage literally made the water turn red. Now, you've kept an extraordinary amount of material about Iris from her childhood. You have poems and newsletters, postcards, and even email. So she must have been a wonderful child. Yeah, um, she is a very meticulous of preserving her mm -hmm. um, writing. So we also preserve her uh, letters and emails. When she was a little, actually, University of Illinois was the uh, you know uh, premier in the emails. So we preserve all the, her letters and the emails. Oh, that must be, it's going to be a wonderful treasure for people who will be doing research on her. As mother and daughter, you were very close. 
In fact, you know, reading the emails um, that you exchanged together, you had a beautiful mother and daughter relationship that was really a heartwarming part of your book. Now, uh, we have actually uh, access to a lot of these emails. And the University of Illinois, as you mentioned, uh, was a leader in the development of the internet browser, mosaic, and email. So you must have both been very early and avid users of email way before it was uh, available to other people. Yes, it is. Well, that's great. It's true I've neglected my loved ones for the last few months. I feel ashamed that I have not even bought you a Mother's Day gift or even a card, only this note that I'm hastily writing from my laptop computer. How I wish you could have been there during the Woman of the Year ceremony. I told the audience how you inspired me over the years, how you served as my first role model. Please forgive me. I love you dearly, even though I haven't found the time to talk to you in the last few weeks. And in a few weeks, we'll all be reunited, and the book tour will finally be over. I feel like a soldier returning from a six months war. Love, Iris. Dear Mom, it was wonderful talking to you and Dad a few nights ago. Few people achieve the level of intimacy and love that we enjoy as parent and daughter on almost a nightly basis. As a family, we are blessed, truly blessed, and we must remind ourselves of this every day. Many of my friends don't feel comfortable talking to their parents, ever. Delving into history, into other people's stories, places all our problems into perspective. Time and again, we have to remind ourselves of how extraordinarily lucky we are. Much love, Iris. Now, she's always been a voracious reader. Now, did it surprise you at all that she became a writer? No, not surprised. <laughs> From the very yeah. beginning, uh, right. I, I know uh, her passion is in writing mm -hmm. and uh, reading. I see. Now, what was your reaction when she wanted to switch her major from math and computer science to journalism? Uh, we, uh, my husband and I support uh, her mm -hmm. decision. Actually, um, it is a big relief for her when she you know, mentioned this. She was surprised. We are very supportive because my husband and I thought um, you got to you know, study what you like. Mm -hmm. uh, that will be, you know, later on as how you can succeed in that field. Right. So she very, uh, we, we encourage her. We have uh, no objection. Yeah. Well, that, that's wonderful because I know as two scientists, you know, very often we try to influence our children to go into the same career that we're comfortable in. Right? Yes, that's how later in life, uh, Iris is very grateful to us that mm -hmm. she said she, we allow her to um, choose her career path. Oh, yeah. that, that's great. Yeah. You know, mentioning this, she was surprised. We are very supportive because my husband and I thought um, you got to you know, study what you like. Mm -hmm. uh, that will be, you know, later on as how you can succeed in that field. Right. So she very, uh, we, we encourage her. We have uh, no objection. Yeah. Well, that, that's wonderful because I know as two scientists, you know, very often we try to influence our children to go into the same career that we're comfortable in. Right? Yes, that's how later in life, uh, Iris is very grateful to us that mm -hmm. she said she, we allow her to um, choose her career path. Oh, yeah. that, that's great. Yeah. yeah. Now, she was also in um, a very good position because, you know, she had a scientific background also. Uh, in writing this book, That's right? That's right. So when you uh, look at her, um, her um, interest in the Chinese history, if you look at her ability to speak Mandarin and uh, her knowledge of science, she was probably the ideal person to write this book. I think so. Uh, okay. Now, it's really her second book, of course, The Rape of Nanjing, that brought her international acclaim and got this book on this New York Times bestseller list. Now, although the brutal acts and the atrocities that the Japanese uh, committed on the Chinese people, Chinese civilians, uh, were very well known in China, this was really the first time it got any attention outside China. Indeed, um, although uh, the, the atrocity 
the rape of Nanking mm -hmm. uh, was uh, um, the headline news on New York Times back in 1937, mm -hmm. but uh, the West didn't know very much until mm -hmm. Iris's book was published. Mm -hmm. And also, I think the book, because on the best list of uh, New York Times, really attract uh, in, uh, attention of mm -hmm. intellectually. Mm -hmm. Well, I also think it was probably, I know Iris did a lot of uh, um, publicity for the book and That's her true. book tours yes. and uh, the wonderful way she has of addressing the audience and telling the story, yes. that probably had a lot to do with the popularity of the book. Yes, right? people told me she not only can write, she also talk very well. Oh yes, I, I've seen some videos of her um, making speeches and she, she was just very wonderful and, and powerful. Then in December 13, 1937, the Japanese Imperial Army invaded the capital city of China, which was then the city of Nanking. And within just a matter of weeks, they raped, tortured, and murdered hundreds of thousands of people. An estimated 300,000 Chinese civilians were killed, and an estimated 20,000 to 80,000 Chinese women were raped. That was then the single greatest mass rape in world history. And the Japanese also turned murder into sport in that city, bayoneting babies, even ripping fetuses out of the bellies of pregnant women. This must have been a very busy time in her life because she was promoting, um, she was going on book tours, promoting her book, and she also had a son during this period. Now, there are some misconceptions about Iris's son, Christopher. Uh, I even read one report that say, states he was adopted. Can you set the record straight? Was not adopted. Uh, Iris Chen and the Brad Douglas is her, you know, biological parents, because um, uh, he was born by in vitro uh, fertilization and okay. surrogacy. Surrogacy. Oh, I see. Okay, mm. so there was a surrogate mother. Yes. Right. All right. Yeah. So, uh, how is Christopher doing now? He's fine. He's doing well. Uh, mm -hmm. He's just uh, celebrating his ninth birthday oh, uh, nice. recently, and she he visits us twice a year, and uh, he's a uh, handsome boy, mm -hmm. but he has uh, his um, autistic um, problem, mild uh, mm -hmm. autism. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I see. I guess he was too young to remember his mother at all. I don't think so. So right. that's why when he visiting us, uh, we really bring, you know, like bring him to the grave mm -hmm. of Iris, talk mm -hmm. about Iris' story. I think oh, he knows. I see. Yeah, I showed the book to him mm -hmm. too. Yeah. I see. Well, you've written such a wonderful book. He, he surely will know his mother when, when he's he older. When he grow up. Right. Yes. Iris's uh, third book, uh, The History of the Chinese in America, tells about the 150-year history of the Chinese in the United States. Now, I've heard some really good reviews about the book and particularly from the Chinese people who are all trying to find their roots and looking at Angel Island. Can you tell us, um, you know, uh, what about Iris's connection with the Chinese Americans and organizations? Actually, the connection of Iris Chen to um, the, uh, the, the uh, Chinese, Chinese American mm -hmm. organizations is starting in 1994 oh, when mm -hmm. she was still lived in uh, Santa Barbara. Mm -hmm. And the, the friends told her uh, there's an exhibition, photo exhibition in Cupertino oh. uh, in 1994. So she drove up to Cupertino to uh, look at this um, photo exhibition group mm -hmm. uh, of uh, uh, Chinese American uh, grassroots uh, organizing, right. uh, uh, organization. Um, so for example, in the Bay Area, there's uh, uh, called the Global Alliance for the mm -hmm preserving the history of World War II in Asia. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's another organization, uh, it's called um, uh, APTSJW, means mm -hmm. Alliance for Preserving the Truth mm -hmm. of uh, History of sino japanese War. Mm -hmm. Another organization called RNRC is called uh, the River of Nanking Redress uh, mm -hmm. Coalition. Yeah. So she involved all these uh, Bay Areas uh, organization. Mm -hmm. That's a start in 1994. Mm -hmm. So then afterwards, of course, there's more uh, interaction between her and the Chinese uh, mm -hmm. uh, Chinese Americans. Well, I know to many Chinese Americans, she's a hero for uh, not only uh, bringing out 
you know, these acts of atrocities and letting the world know about it. But she was such a, a passionate and a, a good, art, you know, a very articulate spokesperson for us. The complexity of the stories of my people in the United States and the richness of their contributions in building this great nation and also their struggle against prejudice in this country would lay down the foundations of civil rights law, blazing the path for human rights activists for generations to come. I, I can't imagine how hard it must have been for you to write this book, you know, The Woman Who Could Not Forget, after the death of your beloved daughter. When did you think about doing it, and why did you do it? Oh, actually, after Iris died, I immediately, I think, uh, I thought I wanted to write this book. It's because mm -hmm. um, although Iris is a public figure, very mm -hmm. few people really know the true story of her life. And uh, this is, the, of course, the first reason. The second reason is um, when Iris died, uh, her uh, son Christopher, only two years old, mm -hmm. he will never know uh, her mother. So I think I should write a true story of Iris, let her, him know mm -hmm. when he grew up. Um, then, the, as you know, um, the medium mm -hmm. after Iris died really uh, speculate a lot of why she killed herself and some which is not very accurate mm -hmm. so I thought I want to uh, write a book mm -hmm. of her true story and set the record straight. Right. Now I was very impressed you started your book off in chapter one very bravely by talking about the night that you found that Iris was missing and found dead the following day. Yes, yes it right. is a light mail to us for right. think, rethinking about that that day. Yeah. Uh, it is a very stressful and uh, hectic. Right. Yeah. We are trying to look for where her car mm -hmm. is. Um, right. But uh, of course, we, we couldn't find um, nearby mm -hmm. shopping center or parking lot of the hotels. Yeah. Um, but uh, then uh, and, uh, the policeman informed us uh, until mm -hmm. the midnight that day. Mm -hmm. So that's mm -hmm. a, um, very, yeah. very uh, you know, right. um, devastating. Right. activist Iris Chang was discovered in her parked car off the interstate highway near San Jose, California. The 36-year-old author was best known for her book, The Rape of Nanking, which described the mass slaughter of Chinese civilians by the Japanese Imperial Army in 1937. Although you are trained as a scientist and not a, not a writer, and English is your second language, you decided to write the book yourself. Now, I really admire you for doing that, and I know it's an act of love. Are you at peace now that the book is written? And what is your next step? Um, yes, a lot of people ask me, yes, um, it take me like mm -hmm. six years almost mm -hmm. uh, to finish this book. It mm -hmm. is, a, I feel, a big relief mm -hmm. um, after this book is finished. I am right now is uh, promoting this book, so really mm -hmm. I have been thinking about what I'm doing next. Although mm -hmm. a lot of people ask me, are you going to write another book? Um, actually, as a matter of fact, um, this book, I, the first draft for this book is 250,000 words. Wow. So it's cut <laughs> off a lot. Right. Uh, so uh, especially the part, um, my parents' is a history, mm -hmm. and my mm -hmm. father's uh, legendary story, and uh, my you know, my, uh, my sibling and I myself are uh, growing up all cut. Right. So I, I thought maybe, who knows, <laughs> uh, I probably will write um, what my parents' story and my story, but uh, um, this I haven't decided. Well, I'm rooting for you to write one because I think uh, this part of the modern history of China is one that very few people, you know, have, have written about. That's true. One person, actually one idea, can start a war or end one, or subvert an entire power structure. One discovery can cure a disease or spawn new technology to benefit or annihilate the human race. You are one individual and can change millions of lives. Think big, do not limit your vision, and do not ever compromise your dreams or ideals. When was that written? And do you think Iris had lived her life according to those words? Uh, what you, uh, you hear is the part of a speech she delivered in June 1998, 
when she was invited back to her uh, high school to give a, a keynote speech and accept an award. Um, now that I remember, it's a very long speech, but uh, what you heard is just the main part of a major theme of the talk. Yes, I think she believed the power of one. One person can change the world. I think she did what she said and then follow mm -hmm. her, you know, conviction, yeah, about this power of one. Right. Thank you very much, Ying Ying, for sharing with us the incredible life of your daughter, Iris Chang. Thank you. We thank you for being with us today and hope to see you next week on The Better Part. My weapon is my word One more time, remember The horror, the pain They raped you of your pride Robbed you of your dignity Speak of how they stole your peace My weapon is my word.